it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, then you're on a path. We're going in a direction. And somewhere along the line, we don't see God's plan and we don't understand God's provisions. Why? Because we're not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do you know both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's blessings always go to those who seek God. He is the rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him and those who follow his word. It's that simple. And my argument is, friends, somewhere along the line, we redefine his words. If words matter, and if words mean anything, then God's word has to mean what it means. So often we'll say, well, you know, they're in a committed relationship. Well, it's still called fornication. It's still against the word. God gave us a covenant. He created it and ratified it with what the Jews called the ketubah. It was a double covenantal contract. Even in dating, you already had a commitment, guys, to that woman, and you already were putting money aside, as I've told you before, where if you walked out of that relationship, uh, it was to your harm. You were not thinking of another woman because you didn't have the money. It was a, there was a beautiful principle that God put in place. When all of a sudden, I went out of the marriage because I'm bored. I went out of the marriage because, I mean, a guy once told me, he says, well, my wife's put on weight since we got married. Well, she had four kids, and she put on five pounds, and now she's in her 40s. Five pounds! Count them. One, two, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, achad, shaim, shalosh, arba, chamesh. One, two, three, four, five. You got it? And I'm looking at this guy. I'm saying, dude, I'm just kind of curious have you put on any weight since you got married? <laughs> oh, she was... What I love about women is they're, so, they're helpers. They're a helpmeet. But he didn't tell me she was more than willing to share. 75 pounds. And that was just his left side. 75 pounds. And I'm thinking, dude, you're freaking out over five pounds? And somewhere... But he wanted out of the marriage. Because he said... I really believe God's giving me a release. But God never gives you a release from his word. And somewhere along the line, let me help you out, guys. I know how to grow a mega church. I really do. And somehow or other, to go to the next level, to go mega, mega, you have to be careful not to preach to the sins that people do in the church and just preach about the sins that happen outside of the church. But the Bible says judgment begins outside, right? inside the house of the Lord, guys. So I don't say this to beat up on anyone. We all have issues here, but it's God who's transforming us into his glorious image. The following biblical character that we're going to conclude with today, this sketch depicts what God has for us and how we're capable of embracing what God has or sabotaging it. How many of you believe in grace, mercy, repentance, blood of the Lamb, forgiveness. Friends, we're one prayer away from getting on track. Don't beat yourself up. You could be all hung up like the thief on the cross. And one guy rejects Jesus and the other guy accepts Jesus. So I want to be clear. Notice it's not good people that go to heaven. It's repentant people that go to heaven. Consider the example of King Uzziah. Isaiah gives him an honorable mention. He loved King Uzziah. But the guy died a horrible death. And just, you got to look at this guy's life because man, I, I, this guy here, we would all have been honored to have been him, believe it or not. There's a lot of cool things about him, but well, watch this. Uh, I, I want you to see how the word brought him blessings into his life. The word brought him blessings, it brought blessings into his life for a season. For a season. Do you know God's blessings are not supposed to be seasonal? It's supposed to be lifetime. It's supposed to be for eternity. Now watch this. This is really cool, man. This is really cool. Don't you love his word? Yeah. And maybe, don't worry if you love me or not. You love his word? Well, you should love me too. No one's worth going to hell for. Okay, here it is, except you and me, and Jesus did that. Uh, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 4 through 5. This is, listen, listen a bit. I, man, I, I wish they would put this on my tombstone. And Uzziah, okay, 
Okay, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. According to all that his father Amaziah did. Come on, guys. How, does it get better than that? Watch, watch. Come here. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding. He was a charismatic. In the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord. Now, God did this for him. You need to prosper, but God made him to prosper, which shows we are in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. You need to go for prosperity, make it happen in a biblical way. But God did this. But watch this. As long as he sought the Lord. Hold on to that sentence for a minute, because it looks like a great sentence. God made him to prosper. I want you to consider the extent to which God blessed this man who sought God and followed his word. He walked in the light. Verse 6 tells us he went to war and God helped him. He went to war. How many of you can imagine going to a war and God doesn't help you? If your kid's doing drugs today, you're going to war. Is God helping you? If your kid has no regard for God, that is a war. Is God helping you? I'm not talking about God helps those who help themselves. There's a measure of truth there, and there's a lot of misunderstanding there. Who is helping you with your battles today? Just hold on to that. Who is helping you with your battles today? I, I can help you figure this one out real quick. Are you winning your battles, or are you losing them? Guys, if all of a sudden you've screwed up, if you've blown it, you've done something dumb, and all you can do is beat yourself up. I just feel worthless. Oh, would you just stop it? Get your diapers changed and get back in the game. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. God has absolutely no mercy on you there. He, I mean, he's, or no sympathy, I should say. None. He causes you to feel bad. He causes you to feel horrible in your sin. Because the Bible says the way of the sinner is hard. The guy who's screwing up, it's hard. It's supposed to be hard because he so loved you. He so died for you. He so blood bought you. So purchased you. So cleansed you. He wants this life to feel like hell so you'll seek heaven when you're living in sin. It's supposed to feel bad. It's like if you ever try to drink ammonia, there'll be a gag reflex so you don't burn your throat and your esophagus and ultimately your inner organs. You are supposed, it's supposed to be repugnant to you. Objectionable. We think, oh, God just wants me happy. What was that song? And now I am happy all day. Oh, at the cross, at the cross. It started out great. Where I first... And the it was there by faith. And then who wrote this next line? And now I am happy all the days. Dude, only a fool is happy all the days. All of your circumstances, everything that's happening, hey, what's happening? Everything that's happening in your life makes you happy? I'm telling you, you're a drug addict, you're drinking, you're nuts, we got help. We need help. I'm not happy all the time. Come on. Are you happy about abortion? No. Are you happy when one of your kids run from God? Are you happy when it looks like the heathen are prospering? No, let me help you out. We're not supposed to be happy all the time. Watch this. Oh, man, this is something. This is something. So he goes to war. God helps him. He became very powerful and famous. <laughs> Guys, I got to tell you something. I got lots of friends that I just love and appreciate. The bigger your church when you're in ministry, Ron, tell the truth and shame the devil. The bigger your church, the bigger your budget, the more people you have, and the more notoriety you have, the more popular you become. All they're doing is getting the fat, the fatted calf ready for the festival, and you are the fatted calf when you begin to believe your own PR. I mean, you have no idea how many of my friends... Bill, what happened? Did you get kicked out of the church? Bill, you're in Hemet? What are you doing in Hemet? Bill, how are you feeling? You used to battle depression and panic attacks. 
And I'm thinking, they really don't get it. They really don't get it. When I go to a pastor's conference, they don't sing, what color is God's skin? It's how big is your church? How big is your budget? Are you on TBN or secular TV? Pastors that have 10,000 or more are in his hand. There is that attitude, friends. Ron will tell you I'm not telling the truth, but I am telling the truth here. You know I am. And guys, don't misunderstand. It's so much fun. You go to conventions. They don't even know you're five foot five. Now you're Big Bill. <laughs> Little Jesus, Big Bill. Wow, so can you speak at our conference and tell us how do you build a big building? You get a lot of money and you find Scandinavians who know how to do it. That's what they do. But we're missing. I'm not against big churches. I'm not against big buildings. That's where revival came in. When God thrust his hand deep into my heart and pulled out plagues and said, you're arrogant. You are self-centered. I'm going to remove the candlestick from your life if you do not let me. That, that's my, that was my ability to lead. I will literally remove it if you don't let me deal with this situation. I remember I was on the floor for about two and a half hours. I thought it was five minutes. I'm not kidding you. Don't tell me God doesn't speak today. God spoke. And God began to speak to me. He says, in the church, you've got people that love potlucks. They love trees. I'm being up front with you. They love Easter bunnies. They love the chocolates. They love the fellowship. They love things more than they love me. And it began to hit me. I'm not blaming you. I wasn't pastoring here. It's not my fault. I'm in Smith, Missouri on the floor. No, I was in Moni, Illinois, actually, on that one. Yeah, God really dealt with me twice in one week. I don't know what would have happened. Marge will tell you, we came back and we went on a fast. I thought it would be for a few days. I literally lost my appetite completely for food for 70 days. This fast was not difficult. I went down to 109 pounds. That's in my book, which I don't sell. I just give it away. But I'm going to tell you something right now. You can, am I saying you should have a 70-day fast? I'm not. I'm just saying you shouldn't gluttonize for 70 days straight and have no appetite for the Word of God. We have to really hear this, friends. The Word works. The Word is authentic. The Word is forever settled in the heavens. What does God say He does with His Word? Where does He set it? above his name and his name is the name we're saved by this is not to be hyper spiritual with you guys my wife then my elders 56 days uh, there were three of my elders they just felt compelled to fast and the things that we saw during this period of time that's why fasting is a part of my life but guys it's not just that there's times we don't realize God will cause us to deny our flesh because we, all we've been doing is feeding our flesh. And within even the church today, we have a spiritual, genuine, authentic Christianity, and we have a carnal, Hollywood, Broadway, TBN-esque. I'm not putting TBN down, but friends, a lot of us don't get it. We can't wait to see the entertainment. Christian concerts are cool, man. I went to second chapter of Acts and Don Francisco. Still love. I'd still go. No problem. But I see people would spend money to go to a concert, but then they complain when the church went over an hour. Friends, somewhere along the line, we have to really hear what I'm saying today. This is something. This guy, Uzziah, became famous, powerful. Power and fame will destroy the person who does not seek and follow the Lord. It'll destroy you. I look back at it, God let a series of events happen in my life, in Marge's life, which forced us to cling to the cross, cling to Jesus, cling to one another, and really seek his face. And I'm gonna tell you something. Here I am at an age that I, it just, my age doesn't fit me. It doesn't fit me. When I say it, it just seems like I'm not that person because I just don't feel like that at all. But I really believe what I, we got from the Lord, it's in every situation, God's always promoted us. 
Promotion can't come from the east. It can't come from the west. Your fantasy life can't be, can I have the biggest church in America? Because that becomes your worship life. There's a line in the musical Hamilton, smile more, talk less. And that's kind of the real key to growing a church today. A lot of smiling and affirming people in their sin. And if we don't wake up and see this, the reason our kids have walked away from the church is not their teachers. It's really not the school system. It's not how rotten the world is because historically, revival, the worse the world gets, the more people run to Jesus because they realize it's a fake. Our kids live in a fantasy world, two-dimensional called Facebook. Really, it's more Instagram now, Snapchat and Twitter and so on. But they are looking for something authentic. When this younger generation really sees Jesus, really sees revival, they will want to taste and see that the Lord is is good. So this man becomes powerful and famous. Power and fame. Uzziah built towers, that we see in verse 9, in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and in the desert. He built towers. That's a big thing. In verse 10 and 11, he prospered and he grew in wealth. I mean, this guy here is Warren Buffett, and uh, this, this guy is Bill Gates, and Bezo, and you name it. Verse 15, his fame spread far and wide. You would think Uzziah would be set for life. This guy's got it going. How well did he transition, this is a series on transitioning, into his success his prosperity, and his fame. Let's conclude with this. Uzziah had a success crisis. Listen to this again. He had a success crisis that led to his downfall. Let me read this. Second Chronicles 12, 16. But when he was strong, this is such a key word, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Oh, we've got a number of people in Scripture like this. Friends, I have a friend in the ministry. I've known him for years. You know his name. And his son walked into a very ungodly situation. Very ungodly. And the father had him go away for a few months, and he's brought him back as a co-pastor and just moving on like nothing happened. He doesn't realize that he's destroyed his son. He has, guaranteed, he's destroyed him. This young man has an anointing in his life, and there is forgiveness, and there is grace, and there is mercy. But let me tell you something right now. When your heart is lifted up unto your own destruction, you think you can do anything. The rules don't apply to moi. They don't apply. God, look at the people that are getting saved. Do you realize they get saved for the sake of Christ? They get saved for the sake of the gospel. It's the word of God that is powerful, more powerful and quicker than any two-edged sword. It's not you. It's not me. It is the word. So after King Uzziah became powerful and internationally known, his pride led to his downfall. Is there any scripture that could suggest pride cometh before the fall. Uzziah transitioned for a season into his promised land. The problem is, because of pride, he couldn't remain there. He was prosperous and successful until he became prideful. How many of you know it's a blessing to live in Hemet? Some of us, you know, we want to tell people when, you know, we're ordering something on Amazon or we're calling somebody outside of this area for fear they might know about Hemet. Where do you live? Oh, well, Southern California. Oh, in the Palm Springs area. Oh, real close to Temecula. Oh, you know you've done it. You know, maybe you haven't, but you know people that have done it. I say, Hemet! A policeman asked me the other day, a state policeman, 
he works in this area, but he doesn't live in Hemet. He says, come on, you don't live in Hemet. I said, yeah, I live in Hemet. But you're from Seattle. I am. And he said, brr, brr, brr. I can't use that language. Are you doing here? I said, I love it here. Oh, you just wait. You haven't been here long enough. <laughs> we miss it. Uzziah, but how many of you know living in Hemet, you don't get prideful, right? No. Uzziah reigned for a season. <laughs> Uzziah reigned for a season. I've got to finish up here now. Uzziah reigned for a season when God's plan was for him to reign for a lifetime. Some of us, we reigned for a season during those two years of revival when God wants us to reign for a lifetime. Some of us, we reigned for a season on our honeymoon, but then our marriage was horrible when God wanted to have you reign in your marriage for a lifetime. Some of us, man, we used to reign for a season when we'd pray for people and we'd share our faith when God wanted you to reign for a lifetime. We all see people who reign for a season. When God desired for them to reign for a lifetime. The Bible says the gifts of God are without repentance. The key is following God, not for a season. So let me finish with this. Inheriting our promised land requires doing the word of God. If you grow weary, keep doing the word of God. After you've done all you can to stand, keep standing. Keep standing on the word. Have you ever been guilty of sabotaging your success? What is it that you seek first? No testimonies today, please. No testimonies. But what is it? Or what is your temptation on what you could seek first? The Lord is fine with you seeking things second. Boy, in Tacoma, nothing against this. I enjoy the Seahawks. I enjoy football. I actually played, uh, I was a tailback in college. Whenever I got off the bench, the coach said, you get your tail back on the bench. <laughs> I see a sea of blue on a Sunday morning every time the Seahawks were playing. And you see all these people thinking, I hope, can you imagine somebody thinking this of me? I hope Wolfson doesn't preach too long today. I've had people say to me, I can't miss the kickoff. I will get up and leave. Yeah, you can put them down all you want. Some people, it's the Sizzler's food bar, all you can eat. Some people, it's the Seahawks or the L.A. Rams. It's, what are we really seeking first? I'm not putting you down. Marge and I are watching the NBA Finals. We enjoy sports. It's all good. The issue of effective transition, and i got to just tell you this, is what are you seeking first? That is the key. We're not called to seek the promised land first, but rather to seek the promise the coming of the Messiah. We're not called to be like the pagans. The Bible says pagans. Aren't you glad you're not a pagan? I mean the word pagan. Pagans. You know? He says, we are not like the pagans who seek things first. Guys, I'm into the stock market. I have to discipline myself throughout the day, not just, I wonder how this is doing, and I wonder how that's doing, or, you know, you get to a point where what does it really matter? What does it really matter? And, you know, some of you feel good right now that, oh, that might be his area where he stumbles. Sometimes more people stumble, stumble over their tongue, which is disconnected from their brain. That's the biggest stumbling block that we all can have. That's why my tongue needs to be connected to the Word of God and in my heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But man, my heart without the word of God. How many of you are in trouble without the word? How often does our pride get in the way of inheriting what God has for us? Here's King Uzziah that Isaiah mourned his death. In the year that King Uzziah died, I was so depressed. But you know what? Against that backdrop, I saw the Lord. Have you ever been so on fire for God and then other priorities came before him and you lost your first love? guys, oh, I, I, we, we have a soccer match, and my kids and my grandkids, and there's baseball, and there's football, and then I'm more concerned about the parents, because I'll miss church when my son Jeremy was going for state and gymnastics. Man, no, that's, that's great stuff. But friends, when it's constant that you're, you're, you're faithless to the house, you're faithless above all to Jesus, football comes first, baseball comes first, basketball comes first, ballet comes first, piano comes first. I mean, how many of you agree we do have to seek first the kingdom of God. And you can try to put it any way you want. But if we want to, see, how many of you still believe God can raise the dead? 
still can do miracles. Friends, the Bible tells us if we don't transition into the latter rain, we're about to celebrate the former rain this Sunday. Don't miss it. Effective transition can never be accomplished unless we're not just a hearer of the word, but also a doer of the word. We also confuse knowing about God for knowing God. Guys, our kids know about God. Our grandkids know about God. You know about God. But do you know him? I meet people who know a lot about me. They approach me as if they've known me for life. How many of you know people like that? I mean, I'm blown away. I'll be in a mall. I was just in Temecula the other day. Had to get a new pair of shoes. By the way, if you're ever, your family's over and the kids, they're doing their s'mores, I think you call it, the marshmallow, the chocolate, the graham crackers, and that thing, and then the, the diabetes. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm in the mall and I had to get a new pair of shoes because I put them by our fire pit. And how many of you know that fire pits, those gas fire pits get really hot? And all of a sudden I realized the marshmallows, they smelled like leather. And... <laughs> Bottom of my shoes, man, just, whoa, like time for new shoes. But anyway, and somebody yells, hey, pastor, and they run right there at the mall, and they throw their arms around me, and guys, just so you know, I don't like this, and they pick me up. I realize some of their friends they can't pick up, but still, they pick me up, and they're like, oh, it's so good to see you. I don't even know who it is. Is it a terrorist? Does he know I'm Jewish? Who is this, you know? I don't know what's going on. He doesn't know me. He says, you know my name, don't you? I said, I don't play that game. Don't ever come up to me and do that. I, don't, I won't play that game. That's bad behavior. If you think I don't know your name, just say, hey, my name's Dave. Pastor, how are you doing today? But the point being, I'm just standing there. And he puts me down in Macy's. And he leaves, very content with this. He had some kind of a connection with me that I didn't know about. And the lady at Macy's looked at me and said, you're a pastor, huh? I said, yeah. Well, that guy's an idiot. <laughs> I said, you know what? He just put $200,000 in the offering last week. Well, he's a very nice idiot. <laughs> I said, I don't even know him. I was kidding her about the offering. I said, I don't even know him. She says, you know what? It's one of the reasons I don't go to church. I like to be with intelligent people. So I had to ask her, well, where do you find intelligent people here in California? Oh, my local bar. So I gave her my card, and I said, honey, you're lost. But now you're about to be found. I said, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I said, that's not where intelligent people are. That's where broken people are, hurting people. And I said, that guy there, we all need Jesus. She says, you're really tolerant. I said, I'm not tolerant. I just love people. So I gave her my card, and on the way into church tonight, she called me. And I asked her if I could tell the story. She says, you know what? I never thought I'd come to Hemet. She lives in Temecula. You know that other name we use for Hemet, code word? She says, um, I'd like to visit your church. I want to come this Sunday. I want to bring my husband. And she says, do you, do you allow us to bring, um, what did she call that thing? She's got this, uh, not a guide dog, it's a service dog. I said, well, yeah, we have a service. We have two services. You can bring them. <laughs> Watch it be a pit bull on steroids, you know. <laughs> you see, friends, the real key is not just do you know the one who can transition you into the promise and the promised land, but the real question is, are you doing his word? It's a decision. It's really time for every one of us to seek God first, and the things you have been seeking Will take care of themselves. Friends, stop seeking younger people coming to this church. They are going to come if we seek God first. Stop seeking this next hire. Or this, no, no. Stop fearing change. Did you ever change your kid when they pooped their drawers as a baby? The change is a good thing. We just need strategic change, the right kind. But friends, somewhere down the line, and this is it, don't seek your appetites. Don't seek your personal preferences. If you're sitting in a church with a lot of old people and young people aren't coming, then it's not a matter of whether we've already died. It's when's our funeral. 
There is such a beautiful spirit here about we're going to reach the lost at any cost. As a man named Danny Ost used to say, Hello, my name is Danny Ost. Win the lost at any cost. And they did. At any cost. At any cost. And friends, as we transition here, we have to be strong. We have to be courageous. Because to not seek Jesus first is missing the mark. How many of you agree? Missing the mark. And missing the mark is sin. And there's one thing you haven't figured out about me, and you really need to hear this. I love each and every one of you so much. That's the nature God has given me that I could give a rip what you think of me. I've got cameras in my face. I've been called everything you could imagine. The reality is I have to love people because the way I'm made up, just my makeup, it doesn't work if I'm not in love with people. Friends, come on, half the world's anti-Semitic. Semitic. Yeah. I mean, I really am screwed up, man. I am, I'm short. I'm Jewish. Yeah. I'm a conservative Christian. And I live in Hemet. That's a great formula. What do I have left but to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And the things he's adding on to us here in Hemet, guys, I believe we are in the epicenter of revival right here. I believe we've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this right here. Come on, Jesus was born in Nazareth. How much cooler does it get? Let's pray. Let's stand to our feet. Father, in Jesus' name, transition, 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 transition. Help us, Lord God, to go the distance. Help us to realize our age is nothing but a number. Help us, Lord, not to look at liabilities. Help us look at assets. Man, we are children of the Most High God. Lord, we have the revelation that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to us. Our Father in heaven did. And it's upon that revelation you're building your church. So, Lord, now that we know that, help us to make you known to the extent that we know you. Help us because we know you and we're making you known to be doers, not just hearers of the word. Lord, this is a great church. These are awesome people. And I believe there's such a hunger and a thirst for righteousness here. I think as the deer is panting for the water, Lord, there's so many people here with their minds, emotions, intellect, will, personality, their whole spirit, they are so thirsty for you. Lord, put a watch on our lips and a guard on our tongue. Help us to realize every word that comes out of our mouth is a reflection of the condition of our heart. Lord, remove hearts of stone and replace it with hearts of flesh. Lord, help us to believe that the Spirit of the living God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And that the good work you've started in us, you're going to complete even until the day of the coming of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. By the way, if you found this word a little hard, I don't apologize because next week is a little harder. No, I'm kidding. God bless you guys. God's favor is on you. Make sure you visit our